So today I'm here with my friend Ikram, my new friend Ikram. Yes, young Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> who's visiting uh, Thailand uh, once again. Yeah. Now, an interesting story about how I came to meet Ikram. Um, during COVID, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of living in Prague, beautiful city, but I was locked down in my apartment for a year, like a lot of people were in those days. And I started watching lots of YouTube channels, especially bike, motorbike related. And one of the channels that I subscribed to was the channel that Ikram has, which I think is called Biker Sam, isn't it? Yes. But Biker with a Y. Yes. I think it was called Traveler MIA then. But right. yeah, I, I, I do everything on motorbikes. So yeah, Biker Sam. Yeah. So, okay. I didn't, because I didn't remember Biker Sam from those days, but you're right. It's now called Biker Sam with a Y, Biker with a Y. Um, and yeah, so I started watching some of Ikram's uh, videos on his channel when I was locked away in my apartment in Prague and dreaming of traveling and dreaming of getting out and getting away. And some of the videos I watched, I remember, were you traveling in Asia, I think in Pakistan or maybe other parts of Asia, and one or two very informal reviews you did of motorbikes. One stuck in my mind is the Benelli TRK502X, what a name for a bike. <laughs> yes, <laughs> mouthful. Um, anyway, that's the background. And then about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, on watching, as I do, watching uh, videos on YouTube, suddenly, uh, top of the screen on my uh, stream, my YouTube stream, popped up another video from Ikram saying uh, that you were visiting an orphanage in Chiang Rai, where I live. So what did I do? I sent a message, said it's a great video, very interesting, enjoyed it, used to watch your videos in the old days, and uh, are you in town still? And you were, and that's how we met, and that was a couple of weeks ago now, two or three weeks ago. That's right. So that's a good place to start, actually, Igrim. So why are you in Chiang Rai? Why were you in Chiang Rai a, a few weeks ago now when we when we met for a coffee? Uh, right. So um, I guess I've got to go back a little bit. First, I've got to apologize because you've been watching my videos. <laughs> so for the torment and torture that you've gone through, I apologize. Um, I, I think uh, I'm pretty sure my YouTube channel was set up around the COVID time, maybe just pre-COVID mm -hmm. and then you know you've got time on your hands and you want to keep yourself entertained and I just did it because the God's honest truth I did it because my phone uh, memory was coming to <laughs> uh, you know its final stage and I thought what do I do with these these photos and these videos so I thought well if I put them onto a YouTube video I don't have to store them that was the God's honest truth why I started YouTubing um, but I, I like bikes and I've traveled extensively around the world um, and I just thought if I carry on doing that through YouTube then maybe I might be able to bring a smile to somebody's face or highlight an area which maybe others didn't know or they might want to frequent um, and that was it really it wasn't about growing a channel and you know making money from YouTube it was just basically honestly just to save my phone because it <laughs> had this prompt uh, 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 memory uh, overload or whatever it, uh, the prompt was yeah. um, so after that I realized because I've been traveling uh, you know I, you might not think this but I've been motorcycling for 37 years wow so I stopped well 39 years but mm -hmm. I owned my first bike when I was 12 uh -huh. back in the day <laughs> in a country where you didn't need a license you uh -huh. just need the money to buy a bike uh -huh. so 37 years i've been riding 39 i rode but 37 i've had a bike of my own and so i've biked pretty much uh, a lot of countries back in the time when people didn't record it you did it for your own satisfaction yeah then there came a time after covid where i realized that i'm traveling but there's got to be more purpose yeah. than for the sake of your own satisfaction and fun yeah and uh, so I did this long trip, uh, 48,000 kilometers. Wow. Four months and 30 countries. So where did you go from? When did you leave from? So I left from the UK. I yeah. rode all the way to the Chinese border in Pakistan. Wow. And then from there, because I couldn't go through India, uh, because it was pointless, as I couldn't then go on to Myanmar. No. I weren't allowing anybody. So to leave my bike in India and then come back to India was more of a chore than to leave it in Kashmir or Pakistan. Yeah. As of uh, certain links that I have there. 
Um, so I decided to leave my bike at the Chinese border and then I caught a flight to Singapore to work because I needed to earn a little bit of money. Yeah. And then Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and then back to Kashmir, Pakistan. And then back home. When was road. that? When did you do that? That was um, about a year, year ago. And a year you, and a quarter. For some reason, although I watched your material, some of it during COVID, and I, as I said, I remember watching memorably you on a, in a car park in Pakistan on the Benelli uh, at one point. But I don't remember watching lots and lots of videos of you going 40,000 kilometers to China. You didn't use that really in no, time. I, to I, make I a did. The problem with YouTube is if you haven't got a massive fan base, yeah. it's very hard to enter. And because um, the way I create my videos, I use it one GoPro and my phone. Uh -huh. all, all the editing is done by myself on a phone. So, uh, and I, I'm probably not that versatile as I would want to be with YouTube, because like I said, I'm not doing it to get massive a massive crowd that follows me. So I put a video every day of those uh, days that took me all the way to the Chinese border. Mm -hmm. So there was a video literally every day, so uh, you know, 35 days worth of videos. On the work journey back, I didn't record so much mm -hmm. because uh, you know I'd already recorded the journey there and I just mm -hmm. wanted to get home. Uh, but anyway, I was, I was, gonna, was going to continue with that. So I wanted to do something a little bit more than just writing. And yeah. uh, I think um, with the kind of things that are happening in the world, particularly now, yeah. you know, I mean, let's be honest, let's call uh, a spade a spade, like the genocide mm. that's happening in the Middle East. But there's other things that are happening in the Congo, uh, the Rohingya in Myanmar, mm. uh, the Uyghurs. There's so many things that are happening that are just you know, soul destroying. And I, I, I asked this question when I did this journey from the UK to the Chinese border. Does human, the word human, does it still have place in humanity? Because mm. to be honest, what I was seeing was that humanity is pretty much past its sell by date. It's on death's, death's door. Mm. Um, so I wanted to see this journey and see people and see if there was humanity was, a, was still alive. Mm. And it is. It definitely is. Yeah. It's just that sometimes media is biased and we see one side, but when you actually mm. get in, um, and see people mm. firsthand, you can see a great deal of humanity. Certainly, I think in the Asian countries, you see mm. more. Uh, maybe because you're a foreigner, they treat you a lot better. Mm. I don't know. I mean, you'll have experience of that yes. yourself. Yeah. Um, and then one of the things I realized is when I did the journey from the UK to the Chinese border, um, I did it for two charities, Orphans in Need and uh -huh. Save the Children. Okay. Uh, but what I found was after supporting them, in, I did... I did a precursor run, so I did it Land's End to John O'Groats. Mm. Those in England will understand what yeah. that is. That's the yeah. most southern point of the British Isles to the most, north, most northern point. I did that whilst fasting, nil by mouth, in 17 hours wow. on a motorbike. Wow. And I raised, I think, a couple of thousand pounds. Mm. So I wanted to do something bigger to raise money for, for children. Yeah. I've always been interested. I've always done charity events, walking in the Sahara for 500 kilometers doing a trip from the UK to Africa, 11,000 kilometers, just shy of 700 miles every day for 11 days on the trot. I've always done things because yeah. I just feel, you know, I, I don't know, I, I feel it's our duty as, as humans to try to give back a little bit, especially if you've been given a lot. Mm. And I felt I had, and I still do. Um, so uh, when I asked the charities that I was supporting, if I could see some of the projects they were working on, they kind of built up a wall. Uh -huh. And I started realizing that a lot of it goes to admin administration yeah. and yeah. the staff that work for these charities yeah. are not very charitable because they, no. they're working for a salary. Yeah. yeah, The people who support the charities, they're yeah. the kind people, but yeah. you never meet them. Yeah. You only meet the staff yes. and it's a dog eat dog world. So yeah. when I said that I was working for two charities, each charity wasn't happy that I was doing something for the other charity. <laughs> and then on this journey that I, I, I progressed uh, uh, through, uh, one of the countries I visited was, was Iran, and I met beautiful children and, and yes. in Pakistan, children and in Thailand and Vietnam that really needed help. And I couldn't say to them, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm not helping you, I'm helping orphans in need. Yeah. And I realized there's lots of charities out there that aren't registered that need more help than the registered charities who have got budgets for media, for marketing, for everything, who've got patrons that are famous actors. What about the charities that are so small that have nothing? Yeah, and it was at that time prior to that because I'd been doing it for I mean, now I'm doing it for four years. I decided every six months 
every six months, I will come to four countries, Kashmir in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, Thailand, Philippines and Vietnam. And I will look after a number of orphanages. It's about 500 children all in all. And I've been doing that with my own salary, my own savings. And I, I don't mind because I can't see what I'm going to do with it when I die. I might as well give it away. Well, <laughs> So tell me a little bit about the logistics of that. Because that's four very different locations for a start. Four different countries, basically. Yeah, You've got yeah. Pakistan. So how, how does that work? You fly? So, yeah. So I fly into... In Pakistan, I have... Uh, and, and Kashmir, I have motorbikes that I own. Uh -huh. In Thailand, I have a motorcycle I own. Yeah. And in Vietnam and Philippines, I rent motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how it works. That's because I'm a biker Sam, and that's actually uh, shortened. It was actually Samaritan biker, but you can't okay. have Sam biker. No. Uh, so biker Sam, and the reason the why is there, I'll just explain yeah. that because I couldn't have the I. Somebody had already <laughs> taken it. And then my friend said, you know, the youngsters nowadays they misspell everything that's how yeah, you're yeah, hip yeah, and yeah. happening that's how yeah, you know yeah, you're hip yeah, yeah, yeah. so i thought okay i'll do it with a y yeah, I'm, yeah. and i'm not hip and happening <laughs> i'll put that caveat in so yes yeah, so i have my own uh, uh motorcycles and and uh, uh i think uh, if anybody visits my channel uh, you'll see that the amount of uh product or load of food that i put on these motorcycles is phenomenal yes um yeah. i mean i put more than you could get in a car Yes, uh, but it, what it does is, um, <laughs> especially in Thailand, because I do that in some countries, I give money. I was wondering about that because I haven't watched uh, your material from Kashmir, for example, but I have seen a few of your videos here from Thailand and I know what you do in Thailand. So what about start with Kashmir? What about that? Well, How is, is it different? In with Kashmir, way? it's more money that I give. Okay. And uh, because it's a Muslim country, mm. uh, I'm uh, I'm not allowed to record so oh, okay. freely as I am in Thailand. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Especially with uh, female children yes, and, yeah. and female staff, they don't really yes. want to be on. Yeah, yeah, and, I, yeah. and I respect whatever yeah, yeah, their yeah. wishes are. So, yeah. so that's not really put on the channel so much. Mm. Um, with regards to Philippines, uh, I have so much footage. I just haven't had time to put it out there. Mm. Um, but again. With Philippines, it's not so much orphans, it's informal settlers, which I know you've lived in Philippines, so you may Well, I visited, I haven't really lived there. Okay. I, and I remember going, was it on Palawan? There's a, a Vietnamese, well, they used to be called boat people community. Right. And I think they've been there for, God, they've been there for 40 years now. Right. Is that, are those the sort of so, people so you're thinking of? Yeah, so informal boat settlers, from my definition, yeah. my understanding of, of visiting them, they're people who have no land, uh -huh. no uh, rights per se, uh -huh. and they live in shanty towns. Okay, sorry, I was confusing because I was thinking of a what used to be a refugee camp. I don't know whether the people are still on the Philippines from Vietnam without a status because they came originally in those small boats from right. Vietnam. <clears throat> what used to be called boat people, and as I I saw them, oof, I'm going back a long time now, thirty years ago, um, visited a what were you, what was a refugee camp basically, right. and they didn't have. Settled rights, and I thought you were talking about those people, but you're talking about Filipinos, really living yes. in eleven million. In, I think in, that's in the shanty town, towns, yeah, in slums. I, yeah, basically, um, and it, and it's 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 dire. I mean, yes, you know, if you consider eleven million people that are informal settlers or yes. refugees of a country that they belong to, it's kind of scary. Yeah? I mean, it's it's and it's sad. So I make I make little food packs for the children, mm -hmm. and I give it to them. It's always children that I support because. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got to pick someone, and, and I've got five children of my own, so they're close to my heart. And, uh, and then in Vietnam, that was really difficult. When I initially started with Vietnam, uh, I was getting a lot of uh, a wall to prevent me from seeing the children that I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see children that were suffering from Agent Orange. Yes. And for those uh, of your viewers that don't know what Agent Orange is, mm. it's the chemical um, that was thrown by the Americans on Vietnamese soldiers. Yes. which then when they went back home after the war and had children, mm. created children that had a defect in their DNA. Yes. Yeah. So disabled children. It's basically um, a war crime. It's, it is it's war chemical crime. warfare. Yes. Um, banned by nearly every country in the world, yes. except the USA perhaps. And uh, yeah, it's the def defoliant. They're used to try and destroy the ability of the people to feed themselves, basically, yes. by destroying the yes. crops. Yes. And Agent Orange now yes. has been... Uh, it's still being used, but in its yeah. uh, uh, newer form, uh, which is what we call uh, pesticides. Yes. So it's basically yes. a pesticide, but it was an 
aggressive pesticide. Yes. So much that it wasn't just killing plants, it was destroying the yes. DNA of, of it, it soldiers. It attacks the genes of, of people. Yes. That's why you have terribly deformed yeah, yeah. children. I mean, I've seen children with two heads, yes. uh, no eyes, three eyes, in, mm. in you know, no mouth. Yes. Uh, and they've got to be fed through the nose. Okay. Um, it's And I have to be careful what I say here because the Vietnamese government were very accommodating and they eventually yes. let me see some of these children and I, I visit Mm. Uh, certain orphanages there now uh, without their permission mm. uh, because I've done it a few times um, but the Vietnamese people are quite a proud people yes. a strong nation yes. and they're very attractive yes. so they don't want to show any part no. of their nation no. which they consider unattractive yes. but to me those children are the most attractive mm. see no evil speak no evil I mean yeah. truly these are angels that's how I see them yeah. they're so innocent mm. um, the best of think humanity mm. are, are children who are so clean and pure and so yeah. so kind and so generous and so you know they have nothing but when I go to them and I offer it's it's weird that it's uh, weird is probably the wrong word but you know when I offer to some of these children you know um, goodies mm -hmm. they give it back to me that you mm. eat with us yes I've never done that I've never seen that if I give something to an adult that he'll say no no you you have it back have it no, it's rare. I'm, I'm sure there are people, but in children, it's it's prevalent. Tell me about the place because we talked about earlier on, before we started this video. You told me about a place I think you only went to about a week or so ago, in Vietnam. Oh wow! It's a very special home. Oh, my Tell gosh. me about that. Um, oh, I, I'm I'm just thinking about it, and I'm getting goosebumps. My hairs are actually standing to attention, <laughs> saluting no doubt those children. Um, so it's. Um, it's a chap, 20 years ago, he set up an orphanage. It's just, it was his dream to how, maybe he doesn't have kids of his own. I don't know the full story, mm. but he set up two orphanages. <clears throat> uh, in, I have to also point out that some of the orphanages in Thailand and Vietnam that I do support don't really get much help from the government. No. In Vietnam, these orphanages get, the one that we're going to talk about, it gets no help whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So what this gentleman has, he has two orphanages and he's never there. Mm -hmm. So, because he's out literally begging for money to support okay. the, or the orphans. Mm. So I can't, be I can't begrudge him mm. uh, that because obviously without money, without food, they will not survive. No. So these orphanages are um, orphanages run by the children. So you've got children from the age of four to the age of 16 and they, they grow their own crop their own fruit, they wash mm -hmm. their own clothes, they do their own, uh, they cook their own food, mm -hmm. uh, they sew their own clothes when they're ripped, wow. they literally do everything on their own. They have one person, the orphanage that I visited, has one person who used to be an orphan of that orphanage. Wow. She's okay. been there for 20 years. Uh -huh. She grew up, got married, stayed there, and she's the administrator stroke bookkeeper. Okay. But she only comes, because mm -hmm. she only got, she got married a year ago, she only comes two or three times a week mm -hmm. and the owner comes they said twice but the children then told me the truth after getting to know me and we were playing that he comes once a week because he's always on the road trying yes. to get money yes. so i don't i don't hold that against him i mean no. but these children were magical i um i went there i didn't realize i should have but I, my gray hairs are telling me that it's not hairs of wisdom but hairs of old age and dementia and stupidity i didn't think that i should get a Appointment before I went. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know when you're seeing children, you need um, an adult there. Yes. Yeah. Any place you go. Yeah. I didn't what, what ages are the, are the children? So this? from four to fifteen, sixteen. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. all different ages. Yeah. So I I went there, um, and uh, a neighbour took me in, mm -hmm. and they said, "Have you got an appointment?" I said, "No," but can I go see the children? And because I told you the owner's never there, yes. and this other lady who's the admin, it's a part-time job, she has another job, she wasn't there either. So through Google Translate, um, and I have to bless Google for making something as, <laughs> as important as that for us travelers, I translated, I eventually got a number, I called, and the admin lady, the, a former orphan from that orphanage, she came mm -hmm. and took me in. Mm. The children were having their siesta, so I, um, uh, I, I, I pray. Uh, my faith is Islam, so I pray. So I said that it's time for me to pray. So she took me to a bathroom. I, I cleaned myself up. I did my prayers. The kids came down. I played with them, and I gave her money. Mm -hmm. In Thailand, I take food. 
Yes. But in, in Vietnam, they're all small shops. There's no big supermarket where I can buy the stuff. Mm-hmm. And the bike that I had, because I have to go in the, the jungle, the sticks, mm-hmm. it's an off-road motocross bike. Uh-huh. I don't carry much on it. No, no. Um, so um, I saw the kids and and, and I, I was just, I was they were remarkable. They kept coming close to me, sitting near me. The little ones would sit on my lap. And I could tell they were wanting for adult attention because they yes. just don't get yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, when I left, I, I was... I, truly, I was distraught because I, even though I left money, mm. every orphanage I go, every time I go, I always take at least one toy. Mm. And I'm old fashioned, mm. so I'm probably going to upset some of your viewers. <laughs> I still take dolls and teddy bears for girls <laughs> and action figures and cars for boys. <laughs> I know we're in a day and age where yeah. it's all, con- uh, you know, it's, it's convoluted and yeah. I don't know what. Him, her, sir, <laughs> the, it, that, I don't know. And to be honest, I'm too long in the tooth now to yeah. really care. Yeah. You know, it's just, people are humans. Yeah. Let's just leave it as humans, fellow humans. So when I left, I wanted to give them toys. Mm. And I went around that local area for literally an hour to try to find a toy shop. I could not. Really disappointed. It started to rain. I had to get back to Hanoi, which was 130-odd kilometers away. Uh, but uh, I'll be brutally honest. Traffic conditions in Vietnam <laughs> make Thailand and Britain yeah. and America seem like you're riding in heaven. <laughs> they are cutthroat. Yes. They are brutal. Very aggressive. Very aggressive. Yeah. Cars will push you out the way when you're yeah. on two wheels. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I went and, and uh, because I don't speak Vietnamese and mm. they don't use the word hotel or motel. No. It's all Vietnamese. I couldn't, I couldn't find a hotel. I mean, mm. I probably passed many hotels, mm. I don't know what they are. Mm. And then I see this hotel and I see two uh, Indian, possibly Sri Lankan people uh-huh. mm-hmm. outside. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, they're not Vietnamese <laughs> and they're outside this building. Could this perchance be a, uh, a hotel? I popped there and it was a hotel. Yeah. And then uh, the son of the owner said to me, what are you doing here? This isn't a tourist area. I told him where I'd been and I couldn't find toys and they lovely uh, boy Tien, his name was, mm-hmm. he said, come on my bike, I'll take you to a toy shop. Oh. So he took me far uh, away from the hotel, mm-hmm. went to a market, found a toy shop. And because I knew the, the count of girls and boys, I bought boys toys and girls toys. And then the following day, because I knew I couldn't get in because mm-hmm. there wouldn't be any adult, mm-hmm. I asked the admin, the bookkeeper, that I let, I told her a little white lie. I said, I left something uh-huh. at the orphanage whilst I was praying. Can I go back? She said, tell me where it is and, and we'll get it. And I said, well, are you are you there? She goes, no. I said, is it okay for me to go on my own? Uh-huh. She said, yes. Okay. So I went there and when I got to the gate, oh my God, the children, every child ran to the gate because they knew it was me coming again. We <laughs> played so much before. And then I gave them toys and then I stayed there for a couple of hours and uh, the uh, older kids, the girls and boys, they said, look, please don't go, eat with us. Mm-hmm. And so that was magical as well. Um, they brought out a bowl of noodles, which had meat, and I'm pretty sure it was pork. Mm. That's, I can't eat that in my religion, uh, per my religion. And I said, look, I'm vegetarian. It was easy for me <laughs> to say I'm vegetarian, yeah. that I'm a Muslim, and it has to be kosher or halal. Yeah. Um, and they said, we'll make you vegetables and uh, noodles. And I said, no, no. Yeah. But we stayed and we played, and I, I was there till really late in the evening. But it was a wonderful experience. And now that orphanage, because it was new, has come onto my list of orphans I will, good. Orphanages good. I will see every six months. So that place, um, did you say is out of the, in the country? Is it, it is in the country. Oh, most orphanages are uh-huh. uh, yeah. that I visit because the city ones usually get businessmen and people supporting yes. them. Yes. Uh, north Thailand is slightly different because yeah. the money is in the south, yes. not the north. Uh-huh. So, uh, and there's so many children that come from Myanmar and and, and Laos. Okay. Um, so, mm-hmm. like, there's an orphanage not far from Chiang Rai called Krunam Foundation, mm-hmm. 70 children. And lo and behold, when I asked the question, how many speak Thai? Only four of the 70 children oh. spoke Thai. Yeah. So, you can imagine the others come from mm. outside Thailand and therefore yes. no, no government support. No, no, nothing. No, yeah. no. So. But this place, because you said at the beginning that they also grow their own. That's what I was wondering whereabouts the orphanage is located. located. If they're growing their own um, food, vegetables, and so on, they need to be. They need to have some land. So yes, yes. out in the country somewhere. There are. They are out in the country, and I think when I was speaking to locals around yeah. the orphanage, they said that you know uh, we can we help, but not like you because you're a foreigner. Yeah. Little did they know what I'd done, but yeah. I mean they knew I'd come to an orphanage not to say hello to the children 
could buy it to, to, to donate mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. But what they do is the locals who are farmers, they give their crop, they give a share of their crop mm-hmm. when they have, when they, you know, it's, it's uh, harvest season. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's just wonderful seeing that kind of humanity. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the children are so self-sufficient. Mm-hmm. It is a, a, a kibbutz, for want of a better description, but run by children for mm, children. Amazing. It's amazing, yeah. I'd never heard of anything like that before. I mean, yeah, uh, that sounds to me like the sort of place that you could make a, a great, if you had it you know, organized properly, you could make a very interesting documentary about that. For, sh- for sure. And I think yeah, they have had to do it. Uh, media coverage. But, mm. it, it, you know, the, the truth is, and this is probably, again, where I ostracize myself from some of your viewers, maybe uh, certainly a lot of the population of this world, uh, we live now in a day and age where everyone works under the umbrella of me, 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 me. Mm. And it's sad. Mm. You know, um, people don't think of other people. Mm. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm as mm. selfish as they come. <laughs> but but you you got to give a little bit back. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah. you know, I mean, we were supposed to be the elevate, elevated species. Yeah. And if you look at the media, what's really happening in the world, yeah. you know, animals are far better than us. Yes. We're, we're, we've actually... You know, we've yeah. we've we've been demoted to the, the lowest of species on this on this yeah. planet. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, but I digress. So why do you think? Because this is something your whole traveling, and also the charity work. It's come, if I may say so, relatively late in life. I mean, yes. you're no longer a spring teenager. Tea. Yeah, no spring tea. For a few years now, you haven't been a teenager. Yeah, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Um. So why do you think? I mean, this this time in your life. Why do you think it's this 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 is a new, relatively new venture. Yeah, with the long trips and the orphanage work, the charity yeah. work. Yeah. So, what, what's that about? Do you think? So it's 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 been three or four years that I've been doing this, but it, I guess it. I mean, there's a few factors. One, I've got I've got four daughters and a son. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm really 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 fortunate because they're educated, they're they're well established, they're they're good kids. Um, and one of the things that I think we forget that instead of giving or leaving assets and, and uh, finances to our children, mm. one of the best things we can give them is lessons of life. Mm. So one of the reasons I do this uh, is because if I do something for society, then I'm hoping my children, when they get older and they're a little more freer in terms of time and finance, they can do the same as well. That's one thing. Yeah. Uh, number two, uh, I was blessed with parents. Mm. We were all blessed with parents. Most of us were. Mm. Those children that aren't blessed with parents, you don't realize that uh, just a simple toy. I remember coming to Thailand and asking um, one of the orphanages in Chiang Mai, how often do the children get sweets? Mm. And they said Songkran and Loi Kratan. Mm. Uh, Loi Kratan. Yeah, Loi Kratan. So two festivals, they uh-huh. get sweets. Mm. I mean, in a year. In a year. Yeah. A child without toys and a child without sweet. Isn't that a big chunk of their childhood taken mm. away from them? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it just makes you feel, and, and I guess the midlife crisis thing could be true as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I, if I prove to you how old I am, uh, <laughs> if I get up off the seat right now, it'll probably take me about a minute to straighten up. Um, so it's just, you know, I know my, my life is coming to an end. The glass is definitely uh, more empty than full. And um, I'm going to meet my maker one day. And mm-hmm. he's going to ask me, what did you do? Mm. I... I that worries me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That really worries me. So you'd like maybe it's a little bit about personal legacy, about you know having leaving having done something good. Uh, you know, no, because no? I don't even think. I'm no, I don't mean in a material sense, but I mean in a spiritual in a, sense. Well, this is the weirdest thing. Now, when you do something which should be normal, people yeah. say you're doing good. Yeah. And when you do something bad, it's normal. Mm. Why has why has the world changed? I, I mean, if you think about, if you go back in history and, you know, the, the, the family unit and how we used to be, you know, love thy neighbor. I mean, truly, we used to, I, I remember when I was knee high to a grasshopper, I used to live next door to Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Cross and I always cut their hedges. Uh-huh. You know, I cut the hedges of my neighbors because mm. I was the young kid in that that street yeah. and they'd give me honestly this is I'm not taking this <laughs> out of the Waltons they'd give me a pitcher of lemonade for payment <laughs> even though I wanted some money you know but they'd give me a pitcher of, and then when yeah. I lived with my grandmother in, in Kashmir for a short while again I would carry people's bags yes. all the people yeah. and I, I think that's normal yeah. but now it's considered oh you're doing good deeds but mm. I'm not 
Mm. I'm just, I think I'm being normal, but yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so what did you do all these years? I mean, if you want to talk about it, I mean, I get it three or four years now, you say mm. you've been doing a lot of this sort of traveling and, yeah. and also a little bit of personal private, if you want, yeah. uh, tra charity work. And you worked, you told us uh, about the two orphan, uh, two uh, charities you used to help as well, but yeah. you decided you can do better work on your own, perhaps. Now. Yeah. What did you do all those years prior prior to that? There have um, been a few. Um, so, I mean, in terms of work, I'm by profession, I'm a chartered accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've worked in investment banks. I worked for the Audit Commission. So I was a government officer, civil servant, for want of a better description. Um, I've worked uh, in large large banking institutions okay I don't want to say investment banker because that <laughs> rhymes with something else and you know what i mean um uh, and i've always done charity work yes I've always done charity work only because um i think the problem is if you don't see okay i think this might even be in the bible i'm not sure but it's a story that's told uh, with a moral that a man with who's so poor doesn't have shoes says to God, oh God, why did you create me? I can't even afford shoes. And then he walks on and he sees a man with no legs, mm -hmm. smiling. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think sometimes we forget that we are so fortunate and other people in other corners of the world are so much less fortunate. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the reason, I mean, I did my work and I, I was like, you know, money mad like most people in the West. And I realized to what end? Mm. Um, and I think that's... Uh, that's that's how I started, and then mm. I progressed. And to be honest, you know, uh, you know, what 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 will you do? What will I do with my money if I no, can see a child take it with you? Yeah, if I see a child smile, for me, that's mm. the biggest prayer. I, I joke mm. with people, especially in Thailand, but I also joke in Christian countries when I'm, when I'm in Philippines. I said, "There's five prayers. You have to tell me which one is the most powerful. One is your vicar or monk. One is your mother or father." One is your sibling, sister or brother. One is your one is your child, your child, and one is just a smile from a stranger. Mm -hmm. Which one is the most powerful prayer? And 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 but I usually tell them the the stranger is a child, and so most people say my monk or my priest. And I say, well, not really, because your monk you have to give them merit before they pray for you. So you're buying a prayer. You can't buy prayer. And I said, your priest gets a salary. You know, it's a job that he does. He's not doing it from the heart. I said, your mother is brought you in this world. Of course, they're going to pray for you. That's, it's not a selfish act, but it's an act that has a personal connection. Mm -hmm. Likewise with siblings and children. Your children are going to pray for you because you feed them. You clothe mm -hmm. them. You clothe mm -hmm. them. So, but the child that has no relation to you, that just smiles because you've done something kind. I said, that's the most powerful prayer. Mm -hmm. So in my humble opinion, I think uh, if I had, if I wasn't doing this, and I know how tough it is. I mean, sometimes I'm riding, you know, six, seven uh, hours on the bike. Uh, mm. I'm going to places where it's hot and cold, and just it destroys the body. But I kind of think um, what they offer me. I don't know what they offer me, or through uh, divine intervention. I don't know. It just lets me. Uh, it makes me feel that I've still got something to contribute and I mm. can still do it. Yeah. Whereas I'm pretty sure if I wasn't doing this, I'd be sitting in a deck chair somewhere and say, oh, my back's hurting me. Oh, yeah. my feet. Are, I can't do it. My knees are gone. <laughs> uh, you know, and, I, I, and, and so, yeah, I think um, until I drop dead, I'll carry on doing this. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. great. Okay. So we were talking about orphanages. We talked about your long trip or trips, more than one, to China. Uh, and uh, we've got the bike connection because I was saying uh, we both got biker names in our channels. You're Biker Sam and I'm Ancient Biker. So there is a bike connection with us. Though I might add, I feel like the Ancient Biker. Uh. <laughs> I'm anti-travel, but yes. Yeah, okay. We won't, talk, we won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> but you said you've got a few bikes. I've only got one out front here, but you've got a few more than me, haven't you? Yeah, I I've got bikes in four countries. Oh, um, I see. Okay. Uh, but... To be honest, uh, that sounds like I'm, uh, you know, I don't know, arrogant or I've, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm... You're a part of the jet set, basically. No, I'm not, to be honest. What I do <laughs> is, uh, the way I look at it is, um, I like old bikes. That's yeah. the first thing. Uh, some people like cruisers, some people like sports bikes. 
I like muscle bikes. Oh yeah. And most muscle bikes are old bikes. So when you buy them at a pretty much fully depreciated value, mm. you hold them for 10 years, they will still sell at the same price. Mm. Mm. So I buy things, I've never bought, a, well, that's a lie, I have bought a couple of new bikes, but, mm. but I really go for used bikes. Uh, and I'm quite fortunate, most of my bikes are in England. Yeah. And in England, what you have, which I'm not sure, Patrick, you would agree, um, most owners of bikes, once it's done 10, 12,000 kilometers, they kind of, or oh, thousand miles, they kind of think, oh, the bike's kind of had its tenure. Yeah. When yeah. really these Japanese bikes, yeah. which I'm, I'm more into Japanese, even though I've had literally every type of BMW you can think of, mm. um, they, they don't even break in until no. you've done 20,000 miles. No. So no. I get these bikes from, um, how can I put it? And I'm, I, I don't want to be, don't want to stereotype, but I get these bikes from elderly white gentlemen <laughs> who are professionals yeah. and who chose to come into biking at uh, their in twilight advanced, years. In their advanced age. Yes. <laughs> and after, after looking at the bike and sitting on the bike and taking some pictures, they basically don't let the bike out of the garage. And yeah. I might add, it's often a heated garage, which means <laughs> there's no white pitting, there's no pitting yeah. on the aluminium. Yeah. So I... I mm, I think it's also um, the bikes that I've bought, uh, I've always contacted the person and tried to build a rapport mm. so they know their bike is coming to Good a family, yeah, yeah. To, to a home. Um, so yeah, I've got bikes in four countries. Uh, I ride every type of bike, um, uh, cruisers, adventure bikes, motocross bikes, uh, scooters. Yes. Um, um, and it, at my own expense, I crack this joke. <laughs> I don't know if I should because this is a warning. This. this is a warning. <laughs> I'm basically a lesbian in a man's body. Okay, okay. <laughs> and this is a joke, remember? I'm not a lesbian. I'm straight. But what I'm saying is, I'm a lesbian in a man's body. That means I like other women. Obviously, I like the fairer sex. But like most women who like handbags, I take bikes like handbags. Mm -hmm. I buy many on the basis that at the price I buy a man, I'll always make a profit when I sell them. Yeah. And if I hold on to it, for me, it's better to have the money in a bike. Mm. And then when I polish it and look at it and feel good and I take mm. it out for a ride mm. on the odd occasion, I feel even better mm. than having, you know, a couple of thousand in the bank. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Doing nothing at all. Yeah. So that's the reason. And that's that's yeah. my only vice. Yes. Uh, yes. Is the fact that I do like so to. So you do have a few bikes. You've told yeah. me that. Um, and it, one of the few downsides, actually, for to, to Thailand is the fact that they have very, very strict laws, import laws about bringing in bikes or vehicles of any sort. And as far as I know, it's practically, unless you're a multi-millionaire and you don't mind how much it costs, it's prohibitively expensive to bring in right. any sort of vehicle into Thailand, new or old. Right. And so basically, the market is very closed. Mm -hmm. And that means... The upside maybe is that the market is dominated by those big Japanese brands like Honda in particular, they're the market leader. Yep. But when I watch other channels on YouTube, like for example, uh, what's his name, Freddie Dobbs, yep. and he sits in front of his uh, uh, mobile phone, his iPhone or whatever, and flicks through the Facebook ads in the UK, mm -hmm. and like you were saying, people sell bikes with 10,000 miles on them in the UK, and after all, if they never leave the country, and it seems that a lot of people, including people with adventure bikes, don't leave yes. the country, their annual mileage is also pretty tiny. I've compared, um, if you look at the second-hand ads, for example, in Germany, where I lived for more than 30 years, um, you will find that people do an annual mileage or kilometers probably three or four times higher than that of the UK because they have the whole continent yes. uh, at their feet, as it were. Yeah. And they, you know, it's nothing for them to go across the border at the weekend and to go on their bike, you know, long distance. Yes. And of course, you've got those, that big autobahn highway network. But in the UK, people, they don't leave the country, a lot of them, most of them. They only ride their bikes at weekends and they only ride their bikes in good weather. Mm -hmm. So that re reduces the number of days they're actually riding the bike in the year. And they think if they've done 10,000 miles, they've done a high mileage, they may yeah. have had it all of two or three years, literally two or three years and only done yeah. 10,000 miles. But what you find in Thailand, and you will find a huge, what I was going to say is you find a huge supply 
offer of interesting bikes. You said about big bikes. I saw one just now this morning on Freddie Dobbs' channel. Somebody who'd bought an old, it was an old, but an immaculate looking uh, GS, one of those GS classic. It's not the GS, sorry, not the GS, but the one with the boxer motor, but um, the same big 1100 or whatever it was then, boxer motor, but yeah. not in the GS frame, but in a classic looking road road right. bike or naked or whatever they call them. Yeah. And this bike was four or five thousand pounds in England. One owner, yeah. perfect pure service history, yeah. garage bike. I mean, it looked like a new bike. Yeah. And I, it's one pity, as I say, about Thailand is because of the is restrictive import rules, those bikes simply aren't here. Right. You, just, you don't find 20 year old BMWs with boxer motors for the equivalent of five thousand pounds. Right. They don't exist here. And in fact, second-hand bikes hold their value very high, partly because, or maybe mainly because, there is no competition from people bringing in bikes from places like the UK. Agreed, yeah. Um, that is the, one of the very few downsides, I'd say, about Thailand, is that, um, you know, uh, and if you buy an imported bike, like those Harley Davidsons, or the Japanese bikes like the Hondas that are made in Chi Japan, like the, like the Africa Twin, they have a huge premium on, on them mm. over the you know, North American or European price. Those BMWs, the GSs, if they sell for $20,000 in Europe or the States, they're selling for 40000 in yeah, Thailand. Yeah. Well, they have a massive tax on them. If I can interject, I, I would say, um, you see, most people use one umbrella, biker. Yeah. But it's actually incorrect. There's more than one yes. umbrella. Yes. Uh, in Britain, you have bike riders. You rarely have bikers. Yes. Uh, if you see uh, biking as a way of life, I would even go as far as saying a religion. Mm. Those are bikers. Most people in Britain uh, have extra money and they want to be in a group, in a fraternity. So they buy a GS, it's a GS fraternity or a KTM fraternity or a Honda fraternity, an Africa yeah, Twin yeah, fraternity, yeah. rather than it being you and your bike. It's you and fellow bikers mm. um, or bike riders, as I would put it. With a biker, I think you find bikers who have a symbiotic relationship with their bike. Mm. It doesn't have to be one bike, it can be several. Mm. Um, but so it's like one and one makes three. The person who rides uh, that bike has now bonded with that bike to a point where literally, I would go as far as saying that's family. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely one of those people who calls my bikes my mechanical brothers. Because mm. I know I've been in situations where if it wasn't for the bike, I wouldn't have survived. Yeah. Um, so, you know. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. Um, the other thing I'd say is when you mentioned Germany, I've noticed when I've done um, um, sort of travel continent to continent, uh, international riding, I find that a lot of the Germans have old Trans Alps, oh. old uh, V-Stroms. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, the mileage is absolutely out of this mm. world when you compare it to British mileage. Yes, yes. And I think it's because, like I said, they're bikers and they have an affinity and a connection to that particular bike yes. which they've had for 20 15 whatever many years yes and that's something we don't have in britain no the the idea of having a bike for a few years and then partexing it mm. for another bike mm. is commonplace in britain yeah i have an nc 750x which i did as is earlier forty eight thousand kilometers over 30 countries in four months i will never sell that bike mm. when i die my kids might sell it or mm. it might go to one of my children but i never sell that because mm. that has a connection with me now. Yes. You know, I've done things on that bike yes. that, uh, you know, it's just, I didn't even think I could do. Yes. So uh, it's like, I think, like, so I said, there's bike riders, there's bikers, and then some of the bikers uh, who, you have people who, who congregate and go in crowds, mm. you know, MCs, motorcycle mm. clubs. Mm. Great, I'm not mm. knocking them. But sometimes when you're on your own, mm. you, the bike, mm. and your creator, mm. that, club mm. is something else yeah yeah and i kind of explained to a lot of people they say why do you ride so much you know you can afford a car why do you do everything by motorcycle i've traveled 115 countries i've ridden in 70 countries mm. and one of the things i say is the reason i go on motorbike is because the motorcycle when i ride is probably the only thing i do where every breath is both life and death mm. and i'll explain that in short when you're on a bike, you feel the wind in your air. You can hear birds tweet if the engine isn't rip roaring. Um, but you feel that nature and life is very close to you. 
Mm. Because you're exposed. You've got no seat belt. You've got no cage that can protect you. You are with nature. Mm. Like literally, you're a bird on two wheels. Equally, if you just look down two foot from where you're sitting or three foot, you have a hard tar tarmac surface. And if you were to drop and hit that surface, pretty much dead. Mm. Or the mm. chance of death mm. is high. Mm. So in every breath, you take in life mm. and death. Mm. And that's a unique situation mm. that bikers kind of understand. If they haven't thought about it, now mentioning it, when yeah. they think about it, it's very rare to be in a situation where literally every breath is life and death. Mm. So you're yeah. living a bit closer to the edge. Yeah, maybe. yeah. And, and you, I think you're, you feel life more when you're on a bike. Yeah. Um, By the way, you mentioned, and that's true, about being closer to the elements when you're mm. on a bike. The one element which I, and I haven't been biking very long, basically only since I've been in Thailand, which is mm. literally two years. Okay. So about probably 30 years less than you. Um, but one of the things that uh, is a very pleasant surprise, and you must have noticed it too, riding around in Thailand, this is, and you wouldn't necessarily associate it with riding a motorbike, is the smell of the smells. Mm. When you go through the villages in Thailand, oh, those and, and they cook, you know, the Thais, they never stop eating. Yeah. They're, any time of day, there's uh, out on the street, somebody's frying up or cooking For some sure. sort of... Lots of street food. And, so you're, yeah. you're and you smell that street food as you ride through the villages and the yeah. towns in Thailand. You're constantly confronted by the smell of Thai food. Yeah. And that's what's one of the pleasant surprises to me <laughs> in Thailand is how, how that's this, you know, you imagine seeing beautiful countryside and you yeah. watch those famous uh, YouTube channels of people riding through exotic countries you're used to seeing with their drones, used to seeing wonderful countryside and mountains and streams and, and the rest of it. The one thing you don't automatically associate with riding a motorbike is uh, the smell of good food. Yeah. And that's one thing you notice. I don't know how it's the same in well, Pakistan. It's, 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 it's basically um, when you watch something on TV, yeah. to make it more than one dimension, they put a, a backdrop. Uh, of certain music, yes. you know, to, to facilitate your enjoyment yes. or yeah. enhance your enjoyment. Obviously, when you're riding, you're right, you're with the elements, so you feel the wind, the heat, the mm. sun, mm. you know, a bead of sweat that comes off your brow drops down. You know, you feel every yeah. millimeter it travels. And again, smells. It's funny you mentioned smells. Yesterday, I was in uh, Pio. Yeah. Am I pronouncing it? Pardon? I don't ask me about pronunciation. Okay, well, it was, I, I went on towards the Laos border. Yeah, yeah. And basically, I must have passed or followed a route that had a truck <clears> full <throat> of uh -huh. um, hogs, pigs. Oh, yeah. Because the smell was absolutely <laughs> diabolical. Uh, and it was funny because uh, before, as you said, I actually had smelt um, uh, the fields. So mm. there, there was, you know, there yeah. was, so it was, it was quite yeah. a pleasant smell. Then it yeah. went straight to a, a really... A disgusting odor, um, but it, it, it's still it's it's life, and it's mm. like I said, it, it makes the journey more than one dimension. It's, yes. it's more, and I do um, listen to music whilst I ride, so I have that effect that you get on YouTube. So I'm yeah. also listening to music yeah. in the background. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's the, those are the aspects which um, I don't know whether bikers. I mean, I imagine I don't know. Maybe I'm being unfair, but if you're a North American biker or bike rider, you know, maybe that's an experience you haven't yet had because if you're going through the suburbs of some Midwest town in the States, you're going past, what do they call those things? Strip malls with uh, mm. KFC and McDonald's and, uh, uh, and all the other fast food chains. You're not going to get that mm. olfactory experience that you're no, going to no, get in no, Thailand. No. So uh, maybe that's something that's very specific, very typical to yeah. Thailand. Or like I was wondering, perhaps it's the same when you're riding in Pakistan. Well, I th I you think get to smell those nice the, food the, smells. I, I think not it? just Pakistan. I think most of Asia, mm. because the way they eat oh, and the yeah. way they cook their yeah, food, out on the street. It's, it's out on the street, so you yeah. feel that. Uh, yeah. um, but I would even say that even in England, if you go into certain areas which are predominantly a yes. certain... Uh, cultural background yeah you feel those or you smell those uh, yeah. uh, those scents and um mm. you know yeah, um, yeah. but what i was going to say about the the, the american uh i, I uh, the, the you know the, the the strip malls and whatnot there is a beauty mm. of riding through countryside there is a yes. beauty of yeah. riding coastal roads there is a beauty of riding through heavy i mean i've ridden in japan and mm. those metropolises those lights you know yeah. it's all artificial but it yeah. is a, Fantastic experience. Yes. Uh, riding through o o um, Osaka and the cherry mm. blossom, that's a different experience. Yes. So yes. I would say, uh, I think sometimes 
um, it doesn't matter where the, 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 the geography is there. Yes. It still has some kind of impact on you. And, and the other thing is, like I said before, the, the, the symbiotic relationship. Before I came here, I had a shower. Mm. After I had a shower, I had clothes that I needed to wash, so I washed them. And then I felt guilty. I looked at my bike and it was dirty. <laughs> so I washed my bike, you know, make sure I'm clean, my clothes yeah. are clean, and my bike yeah. is clean. Yeah. And it's funny because most people in England wouldn't mm. take a bike to a car wash. Yeah. Because one, it's, it, it has a, a intricate machinery and you don't want something, you know, a, a jet wash blowing out an electrical circuit, whatever. But actually washing it makes you closer. Because mm. you're, you're literally, it's like, you know, it, it's... It has it's a it's a it's a product that has no life, mm. but you feel it's alive mm. when you're on it. So you develop a relationship you do. with it. You do. I think that's what it's about. Yeah, that's, yeah, for sure. Okay, for sure. That's a good place to wrap up. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> Krim, it's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, pleasure was very, mine. Uh, in a very interesting and enjoyable, very wide ranging uh, conversation we yeah. had. And uh, uh, thank all, you. All, all, all. Uh, <laughs> all rated a, 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 um, a position which allows us to have this conversation. Once the camera's off, we'll talk about the other stuff. Uh, okay. The stuff that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, okay, we won't talk about those things. <laughs> <laughs> Not in front of the camera. Uh, yeah, okay. no, we're jesting, we're right, jesting. Okay. Thank you, Increm. No nice worries. You again. Nice talking. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.